Hey everybody, Pastor Greg here. I'm excited about life and I know that you are too because life is so good and it keeps getting better all the time. I'm excited because it's the month of February. It's the month of love, it's Black History Month, and it's also the month for the series that we're focusing on Byron Katie and the work, inspired by her latest book, A Mind at Home with, her, with Itself. If you'd like to purchase the book, you can click this link here and also we have a link available for you to download the work worksheets to, to use One Belief at a Time or the Judge Your Neighbor worksheet and also the little book of the work which explains more about this wonderful process that has come to us through Byron Katie. We have a powerful message in store for you today. Let's get into it. So you've heard the synopsis for our series this month. Yes, yes. And we are inspired by Byron Katie. And as I was preparing for this message, what came to my mind was the lyrics of a song that is now an old song. It really surprises me. This song is 21 years old now, back in 97. Uh-huh. Yeah, right? Yeah, just breathe that in. 97 is 21 years ago. Erica Badu came onto the scene with a powerful first single with a video inspired by the color purple. Y'all know the song, right? On and on. And she says something in that song that has always stuck with me. The man that knows something knows that he knows nothing at all. Powerful truth. And she was echoing something that we've heard Throughout time, the, the great philosopher Socrates has says, I am the wisest man alive, for I know one thing, and that is I know nothing. He also said, the only true wisdom is knowing you know nothing. Now, Byron Katie, in her latest book, A Mind at Home with Itself, she talks about it this way. She writes, I tested what happened when I didn't respond to the thoughts of I want, I need, I shouldn't, I should. I witnessed the world beyond those apparent requirements and I found none of them to be true. None of these thoughts could stand up to inquiry. Eventually you find yourself ending every thought with a question mark, not a period. You're able to rest in the never ending enlightenment of the don't know mind. The don't know mind is the path to enlightenment. That's what she's offering us in this text and it's beautiful. Of course, we encourage you to go out and get the book if, if you desire to read A Mind at Home uh, with itself. I also encourage you to go back to uh, February 2015. We did a series based on the work, and it was just called The Work, Four Questions That Can Change Your Life. Uh, and so we're going to kind of take that foundation and keep moving forward. Now, when we talk about the work and we talk about these four questions, I think it's important that we know what the four questions are, right? So what are the four questions? Number one, is it true? Number two, can you absolutely know it's true? Number three, how do you react? What happens when you believe that thought? And then the fourth question, which I call the imagination step, who would you be without that thought? And then finally, after you've moved through the four questions, then you turn that statement around, that belief. You turn it around. And now what we've done is we have worksheets available, the one belief at a time worksheet that will take you through the questions. It gives you examples of how to use the questions and how to carry yourself through the work. So at the end of this message, at the end of service, if you're really interested in, in, in bringing your don't know mind uh, to this process, then you can grab a worksheet uh, and take it home with you. We will also make those worksheets available uh, online so you can download them. So one of the things here at CSC that, that I love, it's one of the things that's important to us when we look at the texts that we use. Um, you hear Pastor Yolanda and I, we talk often about Abraham Hicks, right, and, and the law of attraction. We talk often about Byron Katie, and we use the work in our classes. Uh, and you also hear A Course in Miracles a lot. Yes, yes, right? That's why we're here. That's why we love CSC. And the thing that I love about those three uh, specific pillars is because in my mind and to my ear, they really speak from one voice, but just different inflections. And what I found over time and over years of study is that many times I'll read a portion of A Course in Miracles and I'm like, wait, that sounds like Abraham. Or I'll listen to Abraham or read Abraham and I'm like, wait, that sounds like the course. Or I'll read or I'll listen or watch something uh, with Byron Katie speaking. I'm like, wait, that sounds like the course. And so I love that although there are different inflections and they're approaching this process through different ways, 
at every hand, what they're talking about is we need to change something about the way we're thinking. And that our thoughts, as they outpicture in the world, create our reality. If we change our thoughts, we can literally change our lives. And so I thought it would be helpful that in order for us to understand the don't know mind is to recognize um, where, we, where, where we've heard about the don't know, don't know mind. And particularly, I think A Course in Miracles has some beautiful um, things to say and to share in the lessons that point to us what the don't know mind is. Because what's important, before we can get to these first four questions, and the, fir the first of the four questions, is it true? you have to have a don't know mind. Something had to have happened in your life or something had to bring yourself to wanting to even ask this question, to question a thought that you already hold. And so A Course in Miracles in the first 50 lessons, but I'm not gonna deal with all 50, um, offers us some, some beautiful lessons that are inviting us to adopt this don't know mind. Now early on in lesson three, what do we have? I do not understand anything I see in this room on this street, from this window, in this place. Now I love this because as A Course of Miracles is inviting us to adopt a new thought system, to let go of the thought system created by the ego and embrace the thought system created by love, what we first must do is recognize that the things outside of us, although we think we understand them, although we think we know what they mean, we actually have to first just, in adopting a don't know mind, say, I don't know what anything out here means. Because the I know mind, the ego mind says, I know what everything is. I know a person of that color is a certain way. They act a certain way. They think a certain way. I know tall people think and act a certain way. I know that people who have X number of degrees think and act a certain way. I know that a person who was born with a silver spoon thinks and acts a certain way. And because of that, then we treat that person a certain way and we treat ourselves a certain way. Because of that, we, we treat ourselves a certain way. Because of that, we interact in the world a certain way because we think we know what we're seeing and what that person means and what's going on. So the don't know mind says, I do not understand anything I see. That's the first piece of the don't know mind. But it takes us further because we turn the page and we go to lesson four and it says, these thoughts do not mean anything. They are like the things I see in this room, on this street, from this window, in this place. Now that's the recognition that actually our thought is what creates whatever we see. But as we're in the early stages of this movement, first, again, we start with the external and recognize that we don't know what it means. But the truth is, it's the thoughts that don't mean anything. And this is then, as we adopt the don't know mind, this is why we can question the thoughts. Because if they were facts, if they were absolute truth and unwavering, then we couldn't question them. We couldn't say they don't mean anything. We turn the page again and we go to lesson five, which says, I am never upset for the reason I think. It's one of my favorite lessons. It saves me so many times when I'm pissed off and upset. Because again, when we're upset, it's because we have a thought that we believe. He should do X, Y, Z. She should do X, Y, Z. He should know better. She should know better. And we get pissed off because they didn't do what they were supposed to do. But when we recognize that we're not actually upset because of what they did or did not do, we're actually upset because what we are thinking or believing about what they did or did not do, then we have the option to change. But that's the don't know mind. And only the don't know mind can take us to this place of inquiry. Now we move far further and I, I love as it continues to guide us in lesson 10, it says, my thoughts do not mean anything. It's taking us back again to that place. As we recognize I am never upset, we go again to my thoughts do not mean anything. And then in lesson 23, I can escape from the world I see by giving up attack thoughts. This is the recognition that everything that we're believing is actually an attack upon ourselves. If you're in pain, if you're suffering because of these thoughts that you believe, you're attacking yourself. And so the recognition is that you can escape this world that you see. We're looking out here. We're looking outside to this world we see, and we're saying something is not right. This is not right, and I feel bad because of what's happening out here. 
But if we recognize that what we're seeing and how we're responding to what's out here has only to do with what we're thinking and believing within ourselves, and those are attack thoughts, attacking ourselves, making ourselves feel bad, nobody can make you feel bad. I hope that's not news for anyone in the room. No one can make you feel anything. It's only our thoughts about what they did or neglected to do that then cause a feeling, an emotion within us. Nobody has that power. Just think about that for a second. When we say, he made me feel bad. You made me feel this way. You're saying, I'm powerless. I have no power. You, man, woman, boy, child, president, you have the ability to get inside my body and make me feel bad. That's what we're saying when we say that. And that's an attack thought, an attack thought upon ourselves. And then we get very specific, and this is why I say I love the parallels. As we just read where Byron Katie says, you're able to rest, you're able to rest in the never-ending enlightenment of the don't know mind. And then in lesson 25, what does A Course in Miracles say? I do not know what anything is for. As we move through the lessons and as it's guiding us to look at our lives differently, it is inviting us to embrace a don't know mind. Now the other thing that I love, and this is the last lesson I wanna highlight in the course, as we embrace the don't, don't know mind, then the question becomes, well, is there a remedy? Like how can we even move past this? If we accept and we understand as we move through this process that, okay, I don't know, it, you know, everything I see, it doesn't mean anything, and the things in my, in my mind are just like the things that I see, they don't mean anything. Some of the other lessons, it says um, um, uh, I, there are no neutral thoughts. But then I love in lesson 30, it says, God is in everything I see because God is in my mind. See, when we're in this dark place, when we're in what feels to be darkness, there's no such thing as darkness. Darkness is just the absence of light, right? There's no dark switch. There's no origin of darkness. But when we feel that we're in darkness, when we feel and when we're in pain and despair, when we feel that all is lost and we're stressed out, what we think is that there can't be a remedy inside here because inside here is the problem. But the reason that we're able to use this powerful process of inquiry, the reason that we're able to use it is because God is in your mind. Love is in your mind. Peace is in your mind. It's still there where you are. That's the only way you can find freedom from the thoughts that you're simply believing, that we're simply believing. So before we can begin the work, as I said earlier, we have to adopt the don't know mind. We have to come through these stages. We have to come through these steps. We have to embrace this. Because you can never get to the point of asking the question, is it true, right? Just as we would never uh, 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 look, go outside, look up in the sky, the sky is blue, and then say, is it true? We would never do that, right? We would never have the don't know mind when it comes to that. We would not embrace the don't know mind when it comes to the law of gravity. We would experience gravity and we wouldn't ask, is it true? Because we've experienced it and we know that everyone can experience it and we've seen everyone experience it. But in order for us to ask this question, even asking this first question is a loosening, I think, that happens. Because we've all been in that place. He disrespected me. That's fact. So-and-so is a liar. That's fact. She's racist. That's a fact. They don't love me. They didn't love me. I'm all alone. When we say these things, and I'm just, you know, I know none of y'all thought of any of these things, but I'm just, I'm just saying these things. That when they come up and when we're in that place, is there any question or doubt about that truth? When we're, when we're saying that we're in that place, you know, I'll raise my hand. You don't have to raise your hand. But when I'm in that place, it's a fact. Nobody can tell me different because that's my experience of it. So that's what it is. But when I allow myself to remember the love that's within me, then I allow the don't know mind to rise. And the don't know mind asks one question to begin. Greg, is it true? 
Is it true, Greg, that you're all alone? Is it true, Greg, that nobody loves you? Is it true, Greg, that she's racist? Is it true, Greg? Is it true that they meant to step on your foot? Is that true? <laughs> Is it true, Greg, that they should have been on time? They knew what time we, they should have been on time. Is it true? Arguing with reality, they weren't on time, so should it doesn't exist. But this is what we do, right? This is what we do. And so in the, A Mind at Home with Itself, Byron Katie writes this. Well, before I get to that, I want to say this. So as we have the don't know mind, and we understand that the don't know mind is necessary to ask the question, sometimes what happens, we're kind of forced in the don't know mind. As it requires willingness, sometimes it's the pain of the experience that brings us to, I just need remedy, I need a healing, I need something, right? What happens is, as, as uh, Yala, uh, Yala Van Zant says, we need to pay attention inward now. Pain is an acronym for pay attention inward now. So sometimes the pain shows up and it's saying, pay attention, go within, go in your mind and begin to question this thought because this thought is painful. This thought is an attack thought. This thought is not allowing you to be the highest of who and what you are. It's not allowing you to be the love that you are. It's not allowing you to be the joy that you are. It's not allowing you to be ease and, and effortless. It's not allowing you to be any of those things. Also, you can't create what it is that you want to create. When you're in that place, you can't attract the things that you want to attract. You can sing, I am prosperous all you want. It ain't going to do nothing. You can affirm every big and powerful Louise Hay affirmation. It's not going to do anything as long as you're in that vibration of, of, of believing this thought that is creating pain. And that's why I love that acronym. Sometimes the willingness comes through pay attention inward now. And so Byron Katie writes this. The mind can never be controlled. It can only be questioned loved and met with understanding. I'm gonna say that again. The mind can never be controlled. It can only be questioned, loved, and met with understanding. Now for those of you that are TM pra practitioners, transcendental, transcendental meditation, one of the things you'll recall, one of the things that's beautiful is what do they say? We don't care about thoughts. Thoughts come, we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't do anything with thoughts. Which is very different when you think about how you're learning meditation. So many other forms of meditation are teaching you to uh, clear your mind, right? And, and the idea that meditation is supposed to be thoughtless. But if the mind can never be controlled, it, should only, it, it can only be questioned, our thoughts, loved and met with understanding. This is why we don't, we don't worry about thoughts. She goes on, suffering appears when we try to control reality when we think that we're the source rather than the mirror image or that we're more or less than anything else in the mirror. You hear that? Suffering appears when we try to control reality, when we think that we're the source rather than the mirror image or that we're more or less than anything else in the mirror. But everything in the world is equal. It's all a reflection of mind. We can control the mind only to this extent. As a thought appears, we can simply notice it. Without believing it, we can notice it with a questioning mind. The thought that asserts itself and wants to be believed comes from the I know mind, the supposed teacher. The questioning comes purely from the student. In the questioning mind, we experience a flow. There's no interruption, no limitation. Control is just a matter of noticing it. Does, uh, it doesn't uh, mean imposing an order onto the mind. If you're a true student, the thought will always end with a question mark. And this is what I love about the work and, and Byron Katie's just reflection on this planet. That we get to come to a place that don't know mind makes every thought a question. Instead of he's racist, she's racist, she's racist? They should be on time. You, you hear the, the, the difference in the inflection? Because again, how we're adamant about, she should know better. She should know better. He should know better. The don't know mind makes all of these beliefs, instead of ending with a period, ending with a question mark. 
And so I want to share this story that Byron Katie shares about an elderly businessman who she worked with. She does an annual New Year's, uh, New Year's Eve event. And uh, she said this was many years ago here in New York. And the situation with the gentleman, he was pissed off. He says, I'm angry with my business partner for calling me a troublemaker in front of our employees. He had no right to do it. He damaged my reputation. My partner should apologize. We've all been in that place, right, in one way or another. And he was angry. I mean, he was there. He was there for the work. Obviously, he had some feeling that maybe this spiritual thing can help me. But this is fact. It's his business partner. They're partners. They're supposed to be aligned. He called him a troublemaker in front of their employees. He had no right to do that. He had no right to do that? He had no right to do that. He damaged my reputation. He da right, he damaged my reputation. You, you hear these statements? My partner should apologize. My partner should apologize? And so, of course, Byron Katie lovingly asked him the question, is it true? His reply, yes, it's true. He insulted me. Of course he should apologize. Now, this is beautiful, and I love this about the work because many times we feel compelled to be spiritual and say no, even when we still believe it's true. It's not necessary. If you still believe it's true in that moment, even after being asked, then say yes. And that's what he did. He said, yes, it's true. He insulted me. Of course he should apologize. And to the second question, can you absolutely know it's true? He took a pause. And she writes that after a silence, he said, no. And she asked him, how did you get to your no? And he says, well, I can't really know where he's coming from. I can't know another person's mind. He probably believes he's right. So I can't absolutely know that he should apologize. The don't know mind opens up just a little crack. It's beautiful for light to come in. Because we speak these things as though they're fact, as though we are magnanimous and know all there is to know, that we live in a person's mind and we can speak and think for them. That's never, ever the case. The other thing about the absolutely know that it's true, as Pastor Yolanda and I say all the time, in order for something to be true, it has to be true 100% of the time, no matter what. We can't ever say, yes, I can absolutely know that it's true because it's not absolutely true 100% of the time. And then she asked the next question. How do you react? What do you do? How do you respond when you believe this thought? And he re replied by saying, I get angry. When he comes up with a good idea, I shoot it down. This, I, I love this, right? Because this is thinking about how we respond. We're in this place of feeling insulted and he should apologize to me. And so because he's bad and wrong, now I'm going to punish him. He has a good idea. I acknowledge it's a good idea, but I shoot it down because he's wrong and didn't apologize. I criticize him behind his back. When I see him, I avoid him. When I go home, I take the resentment with me and I complain to my wife. See how this just plays on and moves on? And so he began to see the cause and the effect of it, the stress that results from believing a thought that might not even have anything to do with reality. And Byron Katie re responded, what would you call someone who shoots down his partner's good ideas and criticizes him behind his back? <laughs> he said with a look of amazement, oh my God, I am a troublemaker. He was right. <laughs> and so with the fourth question, the imagination step, we take a breath and we allow ourselves to imagine who would we be without the thought? What would our life look like? What would we be doing? What would we be saying? And this gentleman replied, I would be his friend. I'd be working with him again, and our company would benefit from that. And I'd set a better example for everyone, and I'd be a lot happier at home. This is where we get the opportunity to now see the fear side and see the love side and make a new choice. 
See, when we're in the fear side of believing the thought that is creating pain, we think that's the only recourse. We think that's the only choice. We're making the choice, the obvious choice, because he's wrong, he insulted me, and he needs to apologize. But we acknowledge, well, when I believe that thought, when I live in that place of fear that's created from the ego, what do I do? I shoot down good ideas. What do I do? I'm angry and I complain. What do I do? I change the vibration of my own home, and now my wife has to deal with my troublemaking self. But on the other side, if I did not hold that thought, what would love look like in through and as my life? I would be his friend. We would be working together again. And our company would benefit and my home would be a lot happier. Then we get the chance to make a choice because we get to see it. We've questioned the thought. And so the final step is after we've gone through the questions, we have to turn the thought around. And as we turn the thought around, we must then find examples of that thought to be at least as much true as the original thought. Because we can't just turn it around to just make it spiritual, oh, well, it feels good. But if you don't have an example of it being true, then it's still not true, right? So the first turnaround, instead of he should apologize, the first turnaround was I should apologize to him. Well, we know why, right? Because as he acknowledged how he was moving and, and actually talking behind his back and being a troublemaker, there was the acknowledgement that, wait, I got some apologizing to do. That's true. The next turnaround, I should apologize to myself. I love that one because it's the recognition, as we talked earlier, of Course in Miracles talks about the attack thoughts. <laughs> He recognized that those, the thought that he was holding was literally attacking himself, attacking his life, attacking his company that he loves, that he wants to thrive, which is why he was upset. And it was attacking the, the beauty and the calm of his home. He should apologize to himself. I'm so sorry for believing that thought that created all this trouble and discomfort. I forgive myself and I set myself free. And finally, the, the turnaround, my partner should not apologize to me. As I move through this process and I see what really went on, there's no need for an apology anymore. I recognize that in that moment, his intention, he said what he felt he should have said. I also recognize that actually what he said was true. <laughs> I recognize where my fingerprints were on this whole scenario and situation, that I was being a troublemaker by talking behind his back, that I was being a troublemaker by, by shooting down his good ideas, no apology necessary. All is well. And so finally, Byron Katie says very simply, when we change our perception, we change the world that we perceive. And that starts one thought at a time. If you decide to read the book and, and look into Byron Katie's journey when she woke up and these four questions guided her, she, she spent about a year undoing all of these thoughts, thoughts about her children, thoughts about her husband, thoughts about her life and, and all the shoulds and should nots and all of the perceived responsibilities. She, day in and day out, began to let these thoughts go. And there's a light within her that began to shine so bright and people began to just seek her out. They used to call her the lit lady, which is funny because this was like back in the day before we were talking about things being lit. <laughs> she was the lit, they called her the lit lady because she was just lit up. And I've shared this story with some of you. Um, I, I was fortunate enough to um, meet Byron Katie. I guess this was about, I think this was in, in 2009. Um, and for me, I had used the work then, and it transformed my life, profoundly transformed my life. And I'm in the Whole Foods in Union Square. I had gotten something to eat. I'm upstairs sitting there, and I, I look over to my left, and I see this woman, and she was just radiant. It looked like sunshine was just shining on her, but where she was sitting, I was like, is there a skylight? And I looked. <laughs> Because I was like, there must, you know, like, where's this light coming from? If you've been to Whole Foods in Union Square, you know the long, you know, windows there. It's like, there's no skylight over there. But she literally looked like the sun was beaming on her. And then I realized it was Byron Katie. And I was like, oh, my God, it's Byron Katie. 
So I'm like, let me finish my food real quick so I can, you know, hopefully she doesn't leave. And thankfully she didn't. And so I was able to have some words with her and, and, and her husband, Stephen Mitchell, and just to thank her, but let her know how much the work had impacted me. But I loved reading that in a mind at home and, um, with itself, that they called her the lit lady, because she is, she's lit. It just looks like the sun moves with her. But we recognize that this is what enlightenment is. It's not about being deep or spiritual or sitting on a mountain, you know, guru, all that stuff. You're enlightened when you dare to question your thoughts and change your perception. Because all of a sudden, everything changes. Everything you see changes and how you respond to the world changes. And you find that you're unified with all things and you can live in love with all things. I encourage you to embrace the don't know mind. If you're ready, we're gonna, of course, walk you through it this month. In the God Talk, we're having a special extended God Talk so that we can move through the worksheets and Pastor Yolanda and I will guide you in questioning whichever thoughts feel troubling. We have the worksheets at the member services table. Grab a worksheet. Again, there's, there's instructions there that give you an example of how to use the questions. We, I, wanted, I purposely went through this example of the businessman so you could hear it and start by asking the first question. Is it true? With that, I invite everybody to stand. Mm. And we take a deep breath in and we release. Mother, Father, God, your mind is our mind. Your mind is the mind of love. Your mind is the mind of peace. Your mind is the mind of ease. Your mind is the mind of freedom. And if God's mind is my mind, that means that my mind is a free mind. If God's mind is your mind, that means that your mind is a free mind. And so right here and right now, we choose to embrace our freedom. We choose to embrace, embrace this freedom in mind. We choose to affirm and declare that my mind is free. It is free of attack thoughts. It is free of painful thoughts. It is free of discomforting thoughts. It is free of thoughts that don't serve me. It is free of my mother's thoughts. It is free of my father's thoughts. It is free of my grandparents' thoughts. It is free of my ancestors' thoughts. We, right here and right now, allow ourselves to be free and lit. For we recognize that a mind that is illuminated is a mind that sees only possibility. We recognize that a mind that is illuminated is a mind that only sees unity. We recognize that a mind that is illuminated is a mind that is free. We recognize that a mind that is illuminated is a mind that remains at peace. We recognize that a mind that is illuminated is a mind that is in joy. We recognize that a mind that is illuminated is a mind that walks through this planet knowing that it is supported, knowing that it is cared for, knowing that we are never alone. An illumined mind is the mind that we choose to walk with now for we recognize that we don't know and we bring our willingness to ask these questions we bring our courage and we ask is it true we bring our confidence and we ask is it true we bring all of our desires knowing that there is another way another way of being, another way of seeing, another way of living, another way of loving, another way of interacting. And because we know that that way exists, we open up our hearts and our minds and allow this way to be shown to us easily and effortlessly. I am so grateful and thankful for the beings, the beautiful souls, the lit minds, the enlightened beings that are here in this place and within the sound of my voice. I am grateful for their embrace of the don't know mind. I am grateful for the willingness that is rising up within them. I am grateful for the courage that is rising up within each and every one of you. I am grateful for the light within you that is canceling the darkness. For it only takes a little bit of light to remove a sea of darkness. So we allow, we allow, we allow right here and right now. 
And with joy and thanksgiving, I release this prayer back into the law, which is always in operation, operating for our good, guiding us into our good, attracting more good, leading us into good, bringing us to good, easily and effortlessly. And to this prayer, we say, amen, Amen. Ashe. And so it is. And so it is. Thank you, God.